<laughs> it's right getting carried away, rearing to go. <laughs> yeah. I want to speak to you on Acts chapter 10 with the subject of the birth of the Gentile church. It's an interesting story. I like the book of Acts, the Apostles, because it's always full of action, isn't it? You never know what's going to happen next. You turn the next page and something else happens. They seem to be here, there and everywhere. And the church is growing and people are being saved and people are being healed. And that's what it, what it should be like, shouldn't it? In the 21st century, that's what we should expect. Nothing less. But in actual fact, more. Because Jesus said, in greater things shall you do because I go to my Father. And I find that a challenge. So we better get on our faces before God and say, come on, Lord, come and show us the greater things that you want us to be involved in. Okay, well, this is a story of the birth of the Gentile church. Do you remember Jesus saying to his disciples before he ascended, I want you to be a witness to me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria up the road, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So the first few years after Pentecost, they established the uh, work of God in Jerusalem. A church was formed. And then they went out into Judea and more churches were formed. Out into the Samaritan area. Remember Philip uh, in Acts chapter 8, he went there as an evangelist and held a crusade and many people got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, people got healed, and that was the start of the uh, Samaritan church. And don't forget the woman at the well, she was a Samaritan, and she went back to invite some people to come with her to meet Jesus at the well. So they were all involved in some sort of way in forming that church in Samaria. And that's great, isn't it, when everybody can be a part of something that will form in the future for the glory of God. So here, basically, there are two characters. There's a chap called Cornelius, um, who lived in Samaria, and there's also Simon Peter, who was a disciple of Jesus. And he was, as we call him, uh, an apostle of the Lamb. In this story, um, later on, you find that Paul, or Saul as his name was, um, who was a persecutor of the church, he consented to the death of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, and he was on his way to Damascus to cause havoc with the Christians up there. But before he could get there, he met with Jesus on that road, and we know the story quite well. He gets saved, glorious light, and God calls him to become a light to the Gentiles. And God asks a, a disciple that we've never come across before called Ananias to go to Paul to minister to him, to pray for his healing because his eyesight had went in the mighty flash of the bright light of the glory of God and prayed with him and laid hands on him to receive the Holy Spirit. And then we don't hear anything more of Ananias and uh, that's quite often the case. God's got a purpose for each one of us. He raises us up for a time and a season. And uh, we have to be prepared for that. Just do what the Lord wants you to do. Just keep your ear open to his word. Just be led by the Spirit. You never know, in this midst here, God might have a special work for some of you to do in the future. You say, well, yeah, I've been waiting for years. Well, Wait a bit longer, you know. God doesn't look at age. He looks at eternity, you know. He said, well, I'm not old, so why should you be old? <laughs> and so there's a work for each one of us to do. Well, I'm getting carried away before I even start. So, yeah, back to the story then. <laughs> yeah. Remember one thing, that Simon Peter, he was a Jew, okay? He was a Christian which is a good thing to be, and he was a part of that church in Jerusalem. And so 
he had a lot of rules to abide by under the Jewish sort of um, <coughs> regime of code of practice. They did this and did that. And so he had a pretty much a, a, a strict upbringing. And so what we're going to do to start with, we're going to put this man Cornelius under the microscope, find out exactly what he was like, and then we'll have a look at Peter, Simon Peter, and see what happens when the two of them come together. Good things happen when they come together. Yeah. So, Cornelius. In verse 2, we read that he was a, a Roman officer, a centurion, and it was, they called them in Caesarea, the Italian Regiment. So he belonged to a group of Roman soldiers. It was perhaps a sort of an outpost. But uh, they lived by the sea in Caesarea, which was just north of uh, Joppa, where Simon Peter was lodging at that particular time. And we read that probably people respected him. Um, he had a good reputation. Um, he was a, a very good, sound person. A man of authority, gave our commands to his uh, soldiers and they obeyed him. And so that's the scene there. And he had a household as well. Um, he had a wife, probably some children, servants and friends. Uh, and so there was a little colony uh, of people there in Caesarea. Um, the second thing we find in verse 2 is that he was devout. And so in that we can say that he was a man that had principles. A man that was dedicated to his regiment. He was upright. He had he earned respect. So he was a, a devout man. Then another characteristic we find also in verse 2, he feared God. And you think, that's an unusual thing. Fearing God, he was a Roman, he was a Gentile, he actually feared God. Yeah, because I believe that in every one of us there is something of the consciousness that there is a God. Sometimes we don't want to own up to it. But he feared the Lord. He knew that God was the creator of the heavens and the earth. And I'd really like to know, and the Bible doesn't reveal it here, something of his roots. How did he know about God? Well, perhaps it was because of the Christians that were carted off to Rome, um, put through horrible torture and horrible things there, persecution. But he might have come across a few Christians and perhaps he might have thought for himself, hmm, they've got something, these Christians. They believe in something. They've got some principles. And perhaps that sort of affected his life. We don't know. Anyway, it goes on to say in verse 2 that he, he was also a giver. It says there that he gave alms. I expect he gave his legs as well, you know, but he gave alms. He, he was giver. He, he put money in the offering plate, <laughs> no doubt. And uh, he, he longed for people to be blessed. And so God took a note of that. God saw that he was a giver. <laughs> God notices everything, doesn't he? And then we, we go down a little bit further. Um, we find in verse 2 again that he prayed and it says there he prayed always now you think well he didn't know God at that time in a personal way that came later as we shall see in a few minutes but he prayed to God he feared God and he prayed to God he knew that there was a God but that God that he prayed to hadn't touched his life yet. <laughs> that was to come, the miracle of new birth. And so there's a bit of a picture of what was happening with this man. And there is another characteristic, and it's found in verse 22, 
It says, a just man and had a good reputation among the Jews. A just man. He, in other words, he was upright. Uh, black was black, white was white with him. There was no half measures. He was uh, committed. Um, he, he, he spoke the truth. And he spoke the truth in love, no doubt. And so people respected him. And even the Jews had respect for him as well. Because I expect he displayed kindness, probably love towards them, and uh, it affected their lives. So there we see a few characteristics of this Roman centurion. Now, he was, you could say, he was religious, but he wasn't righteous. <laughs> that was the state that he was in. He was seeking after God, but he probably didn't realise that he was seeking after God. You know, in my teens, I used to go to bed, and I used to have an argument with the Lord. I didn't know the Lord. I used to say, there, there can't be a God. You know, impossible to prove that there's a God. And I used to have an argument with myself, and blaming it onto God. Well, as regards the Bible, it's a book full of fairy stories, no doubt. Can't be true. It's only a book. How do they know it is true? And so this went on for a number of months until I went into an apprenticeship in the power industry until I met a person called Michael that invited me over to his church for a youth squash. And I, I turned him down twice, but on the third attempt I went and I found Jesus for myself. That was in 1964, became a Christian. Yeah, God is real. But sometimes we don't realise. We might fight against God, but we're actually fighting for the truth. We're trying in our consciousness, which we're not conscious that we have got a consciousness, to get me drift. Something was going on, and it was by the Spirit of God. And that's how the Spirit of God works sometimes. He stirs us up. And he brings out what's inside. But God sees all. You know? And God saw the heart of this man, Cornelius. Took note of his prayers. Took note of his giving. Yes. Now, God spoke to him one day by an angel. And that must have been an experience, mustn't it? I expect he was a bit frightened. Angel didn't say fear not, like sometimes angels do. <laughs> But he, was, he had a, a vision of this angel in a dream. That was the thing. And uh, the angel said, I want you to go up, send some men to Joppa, Joppa, and you'll find a man there called Simon Peter. Go and contact him. Ask him to come with you and come back to Caesarea. So that's what he did. Okay. We'll leave, we'll leave Cornelius at uh, Caesarea for a minute. And we put the microscope now and the spotlight on Peter. <laughs> Good old Peter. Well, he was lodging. If you look in Acts chapter 11, I think it is, he was doing a bit of evangelism along the coast and uh, people were being <coughs> saved. And he, he met up with this uh, Simon who was a, a tanner. I don't know... Uh, what he actually did, perhaps he worked with leather and tanned the leather, who knows. But anyway, um, he was there, lodging at his house by the seaside. So he had a bit of a break, didn't he? He had a sniff of the fresh air of the sea and he relaxed in his house. Uh, and so <clears throat> the story goes on that um, he was getting a bit hungry. Like us all, we all get hungry, don't we? We look forward to our Sunday lunch if you're having one, or an evening meal if you're having one. We all get hungry. And so he went up on top of the uh, house to pray. And uh, the Bible reveals here <coughs> that when he prayed, he fell into a trance. And God was showing him things which were applicable to his life. And he had this vision of a white sheet coming down from heaven with all creepy crawlers 
all four-footed beasts, birds of the air. And he thought, strange. And then God said to him, Simon, kill and eat. What? No, not me. No, I can't do that. They're unclean. I can't eat that. That's not the right food to eat. <coughs> and God had to show him that don't call what I call clean, unclean. And God was starting to unravel in his heart some of his mindset, some of the prejudices that he had against Gentile people. I mean, he really thought deep down that there was no way that a Gentile could come to know God. It's for the Jews. Salvation belongs to the Jews. That's what Jesus said at the well in John 4. But <laughs> God had to change his mindset because God was about to do something mighty. There's an outpouring of the Spirit going to come around the corner over this church that was meeting at Caesarea. And so he gave in. You've got to get, give in to God in the end. And, you, know, you know, you can fight and rebel against God for a bit, but God always wins. All right? He's a winner. And he wants to win you over. That's the important thing to remember. So in the story, cutting a long story short, <coughs> we read in verse 14, he says, Not so, Lord, no way. And the voice said to him the second time, what I have called clean, you must accept and not call common. And then he told him that there were some people coming up to Joppa, to Simon's house, and I want you to go back with them to Caesarea. And so that's what happened here in this story. Uh, we go back now to Caesarea. The people came and found the house of Simon the Tanner by the seaside. They found Simon Peter and they went in, had a word with him and they said, well, our master has had a vision and uh, they've asked us to come and find you to invite you back to the house of our master Cornelius. And so Peter agreed and I, I expect he wondered, hmm, I wonder what's happening down there. Why have I got to go and speak to Gentiles? Hmm, all right. All right. All would be revealed, Peter, and this is what happened. <coughs> so Peter, Peter came down, knocked on the door, found Cornelius. He had a wonderful welcome by Cornelius, we invited him into the house, and he was shot. And everybody that was with him was shot because there were so many people gathered. All the friends of uh, Cornelius and his wife, his servants, and some of his friends. And he was thinking to himself, wow, this is good. This is good to preach the gospel here. I've got a captive audience. They're all sitting down. <laughs> God got them all in one place at the right time, in the right place. Yes. So what did Peter do? Well, Peter thought, well, perhaps I ought to give him some lessons in uh, becoming a Jew, a Judaism. No, I better not do that, he thought. And then all of a sudden, he started to open his mouth. And guess what? The Holy Spirit started to take over. Put the words in the mouth of Peter. <coughs> and he started to preach Jesus to them. You see, there's no other name given above, uh, under, uh, under heaven or earth, that people might be saved. It's through the name of Jesus. And so he started to preach about Jesus. What did he say about Jesus? Well, it says there in verse 36, he says, Jesus is our peace. Jesus is Lord over all. Verse 39, Jesus was the one that was crucified. Verse 10 again, Jesus was the one that rose again on the third day. He's the resurrected one. Verse 42, Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. 
and in verse 43, he preached for the remission of sins and faith in him. And then he mentioned about Jesus' work on earth, verse 38, that Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit and went about doing good, healing all manner of sickness and disease, ministering to those oppressed by the devil. In a sense, that was the gospel in a nutshell. He preached Jesus, the good news that Jesus saves. Jesus rose again from the dead. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our Saviour and our Lord. Now, verse 44, a big surprise took place. <coughs> it says, while Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Wow, fancy that. The Holy Spirit being outpoured upon Gentile people. And I expect there was a lot going on in Peter's mind, thinking, yeah, I don't understand this. This has got to be a God thing. I couldn't uh, manufacture something like this. This is the work of God, he thought to himself. And so that's what happened. The Holy Spirit was outpoured. Yes. And you see, the Bible says it's not by mine, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. And the Holy Spirit is the one that brings conviction of sin and shows people all about Jesus Christ. And so Peter said, well, something mighty has happened here. I, I, I can't refuse to baptise them in water because they're all speaking in other tongues. And so the Spirit has fallen upon them. Who am I to argue with what's happened here? It knocked him for six. But he, he, he knew that God was at work. And so this is what happened. He heard them speak in tongues and magnifying the Lord. Then Peter in verse 47 says that he was surprised. Can anyone forbid water? that they should not be baptised. <coughs> God's poured out his spirit, just like he did with us at the beginning. And so, <laughs> it says there in verse 48, they asked them to stay for a few more days. I wonder what they did in those few <laughs> days that Peter stood, uh, uh, stayed with them. I bet they had a mighty time. I bet he discipled them. I bet he told them more about the scriptures, more about Jesus. I bet they grew. They became hungry. They wanted to know more. Yeah? What a wonderful time in that household to be touched by the spirit of the living God. Revival had come, had fallen upon these people at Caesarea. All, the world, all, all throughout the world, Bible says, the, the preaching of the gospel will take place. Peter's prejudices about the Gentiles, which he considered to be heathen, uncircumcised heathen, his mindset was put in order. And so he thought, right, I've got to go back now. Uh-oh, I've got to go back to Jerusalem and report to the elders there what's happened. And I, th I think he thought, oh dear, what are they going to think? <laughs> so he went back and he told the story to them, all what had happened at Caesarea. And uh, they rejoiced, they magnified the Lord because they recognised it was the work of the Holy Spirit. Who could stop the work of God taking place? And that was the start. That was the birthing of the church amongst the Gentiles. What was Paul doing in this time? He got saved, didn't he? Well, he was in a desert, the Arabian desert, according to Galatians, for three years. He went to Bible school 
and his principal was Jesus Christ himself. <laughs> Taught him, downloaded the word of God to him, gave him revelation, showed him mysteries in the spirit. He had a real good one-to-one -one teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the resurrected one. And so when he finally emerged, because you see, a lot of people were suspicious of Pete, uh, um, Paul because he had a reputation, didn't he? He didn't have a very good start in life. He was a persecutor of Christians, consented to the death of Stephen. And so they thought, uh-oh, watch out, be on your guard, friends. You know, if he comes into your church, you know, give him a bit of space, but, you know, don't, don't accept uh, all that he says. You know, we don't want to fall into error. Uh-oh, they were on their guard. Mm -hmm. They were on their guard. But they didn't need to worry. <laughs> because God was with Paul the Apostle. And we find in Acts chapter 12, it was Barnabas that went and found the Apostle Paul and brought him out into the light, revealed him to the church, backed him up, supported him and said, no, he's a good brother in the Lord. He's genuine. He's found Christ as his saviour. Don't worry. He's okay. He's okay, mate. He's okay, friends. Accept him. He's a brother in the Lord. And so that's what happened there. And then we end up that uh, Paul goes to Antioch in Acts 13 and uh, goes with a few others, Silas and John, John Mark and Barnabas. And they had an encounter again with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit said to Paul and Barnabas, I set you out as missionaries. Go and be a light to the Gentiles. So that was the start of Paul's contribution to bring about salvation to the Gentile world. And he went all over the place around that Mediterranean area into Asia. And you've only got to sort of look at the missionary journeys and find a decent map if you've got one in your Bible and you'll find exactly the first missionary journey, the second missionary journey, all the places that he went and he established churches and appointed elders over those places, got in touch with uh, Timothy, the young pastor, put him over certain churches to look after. He even spoke to a, a young pastor called Titus and said, I want you to go to Crete, Crete and be the pastor there and teach them sound doctrine. So that was the start of the growth of the Gentile church. There's only one church. It's full of Gentiles, it's full of Jews, it's full of Greeks, it's full of um, Muslims as they give their lives to the Lord. Yeah, Africans are in, in part. If you look in Revelation chapter 5, you'll see in heaven there's people from all tongues, all races, all cultures, all colours. Hallelujah, it was an international church that Jesus died for. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, the work goes on, even today. Churches are being formed. Churches are being planted. I wonder what God's got for us. I wonder what God's got for you in Kent, I wonder. Yeah, I, I bet good things are happening down there in England. No, <laughs> not too sure. <laughs> Pray for us here, won't you, in Pembrokeshire. It might be rural, but God's at work. God's pouring out his spirit. God's saving people. God's healing people. God's at work. Hallelujah. Because it's all about Jesus. Jesus working through us, his people. Amen? That's really all I've got to say. But thank the Lord that all the barriers were broken down, that Peter was obedient, sorted, the out, sorted out his mindset, and he took that journey up to Caesarea, went into that house and preached Jesus to them, and they came into salvation. I bet Cornelius was a better officer, a commander, but now he found Jesus as his saviour. I bet he prayed better, prayed more. He could now pray in the spirit, couldn't he? 
I bet he went into his pocket and got more money out now he was a Christian and put it into the offering plate. You see, not only did he give his arms, he gave his heart. And that's what happens in there. When Jesus gets a hold of you, he changes and transforms our lives completely. And we give our all to Jesus. That's it. 